And good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Cook. I'm the Information Security Officer for Campus here at San Jose State. I want to thank everybody who's here in person uh, for joining us for this event. We also have a live stream going, so for those of you who've dialed in from your rooms, your dorm rooms, your offices, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, October is many things to many different people. For some people, it's National Pizza Month. Uh, for some people, it is Worldwide Radio Day. For some people, it is Pharmacist Appreciation Week. It means a lot of things to a lot of different people. For some, maybe most, it's the month for a certain festival in Germany. <laughs> Before we get started, I do want to take a minute to talk about a very special week, especially what's going on right now. Uh, this particular week, the week of October 9th, is actually National Fire Prevention Week. And as many of you saw and smelled on your walks here, there, there are some pretty serious wildfires affecting California, a lot of the state, affecting other states, other countries. And Hein and I, our information security analyst, actually spent the last two days in Sacramento meeting with some of our colleagues across the state. In our drive back, we actually got to see firsthand what was going on. We, we went about 20 miles from where the fires were, and the smoke is literally so thick, you cannot see the sun anymore. You can look straight at it and see nothing. Very, very moving as you go through that area. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge what's going on, but also share that our hearts and our thoughts are with everybody who's impacted by these, whether it be the devastation caused by the fire, lost a loved one, or knew somebody who is impacted by this. On a less somber note, October also plays host to Cybersecurity Awareness Month. This national program started in 2004. It's a joint effort by the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And cybersecurity is obviously a shared responsibility between everybody. It's the people who keep the bad guys out of systems. It's the people who use the systems every day. It's an effort that everybody has to participate in in order to keep our data secure. Uh, you've no doubt seen emails from me. You've seen the SJSU homepage has cybersecurity awareness tips on it right now. Uh, you may or may not have seen that information's confidential, a fake phishing attempt from the security office trying to get your SJSU on username and password. But this, this is all about sharing, this is all about learning, this is all about just raising awareness for cybersecurity. One of the things that's also very important in cybersecurity is that this is a growing field. This is an area where we're going to need more and more people in the workforce, we're going to need more and more people helping figure out how the bad guys are doing what they do, more and more people helping protect your data. So today, I'd like to introduce Sasha Helber. Sasha Helberg is a senior research analyst at Trend Micro. She has over 30 years' experience in the cybersecurity field. She and her team research threats. Basically, how do the bad guys accomplish what they're trying to accomplish? Her skills and experience have attracted the attention of the government, law enforcement, financial institutions, all sorts of people out there asking her for her help. So I'm very excited to have her, and please join me in welcoming her to SJSU. came up to you and went, hey, Sash, I got a problem. My, my computer is hungry and it's hot. I'm getting her audio. You're thinking a little bit nuts, right? So 30 years ago, one month ago, in September, I was doing tech support at a campus. A professor walks in and he goes, okay. Um, he turned around and said, my computer's hungry and it's high. And I'm looking at him like, Sir, what did you have for lunch? My mistake. Thank you. Um, he goes, I'm like, sir, what did you have? Like a single martini, a double martini? Like, what do you mean your computer is hungry and it's high? He's like, no, 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 come here, come here, come here, come here. You gotta see this. I'm like, okay. I go over to his office and I sit there and you sit in front of these really, you know, the old computers, and you sit in front of it, and it's going, give me cookie, give me cookie, give me cookie. What the? Okay. And I'm like, what? I, uh, okay. So I hit the button and it goes, you're stoned. <laughs> that was an interesting problem. Nobody had ever heard of computer viruses at that point, okay? Did not exist. There was no such thing as computer viruses at that point. So I'll get into that story a little bit more in a minute. Um, from that point forward, I had to spend a whole bunch of time trying to clean up the campus when the, in a world of no antivirus software, didn't exist. It was less than fun, so I decided at that moment I wanted to make 
the people who had made my life at that point hell, I kind of wanted to pay it back. So I pretty much spent my entire career spending time going over it. Because we're doing Cybersecurity Month, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my experiences that I'm doing, that I've done, and I promise I won't sound like that jerk, like, ooh, I got to do this. It's to show you that a career in this area can be very interesting. There are currently seven jobs open for every person who has experience in this area. There is a lot of opportunity in this area. And the nice thing about talking about the work that I've done is I'm hoping to give you some cyber hygiene suggestions that seem to have lasted the test of time as I've been doing this. Hopefully both help you a little bit in cybersecurity awareness, give you some food for thought on where you could perhaps take some of your studies. And trust me, it's interesting. You might think you have to be an Uber geek. Do I look like an Uber geek? I look like a minivan driving soccer mom, which is pretty much what I am, okay? So why Trend Micro? Um, I am really lucky. My company's mission, the entire focus of the company is protecting the digital world. The owner of the company is a wonderful lady. She makes it a point to try and talk to everybody regularly, like every individual employee. And she came up to me one time and she goes, Sasha, I really like the work you're doing. I'm like, but Eva, I don't understand. You want me to be focused on the bad guys. How do we make money this way? And she goes, Sasha, I have 100% success rate protecting my customer if you get them on the, off the street before my customers get attacked. And I went, I've never heard a person say that before. Try and find a job where you have that kind of support and you will be, get to have the best job you will ever have. Um, I've been having a blast working for the company. And we're deeply committed to finding a whole bunch of really talented folks such as yourselves in this area. So it's really nice to be able to get to work there. Now, one of the things I want to tell you is I actually, having covered four decades, effectively, I kind of have the Forrest Gump of careers. So it, it covers a whole bunch of interesting different things that I was going to tell you a bit about. In that first story, when I was hunting around trying to find what, what is this thing, I knew coding. I learned coding on mainframes at that point. This code replicated itself. It somehow you put the disk in, and then the next disk, there's a whole bunch of analysis. So it sounds technical, but most of my job there was logistics, trying to find somebody who could tell me what that was. I actually, after a while, had done it so much, I wrote a paper on the history of computer viruses to help explain all the stuff that I found in 1990, okay? Which is kind of funny. I have a question for you all. How long do you think computer viruses have actually existed? At that point, I thought that was new and wonderful. So, raise of hands for those that are in the room. Who thinks it was back in the 90s? 80s? 70s? 60s? Nobody for the 60s? 1960, first, 1968 was the first computer virus that was ever written. Wow. Okay, big, huge mainframes back in uh, Bell Labs. So if you ever get a, if you decide you want to go on the malware side of things, it's a really interesting paper. You're, it, it's more fascinating to read the thought process that went in and how can we make self-replicating code. Yeah, I learned a lot. So please remember, in the four epochs of my career, the first one, there was no field in IT security at all. Didn't exist. This whole hygiene thing about not sharing disks was near impossible and not sharing USB keys and being careful where you clicked, there was no internet. Your computer would, you'd have to intentionally move disks back and forth so the computer could be used itself to replicate. It made for some interesting discussions with folks on how do you teach cybersecurity awareness when cybersecurity as even being an area just was unheard of. I had a professor who told me that it was never gonna be a viable area of crime. I'm glad he was wrong. <laughs> One of the things that I was doing above and beyond writing um, to try and help support myself at the time, because I liked this area and I didn't really wanna do much else, was I was a consultant on things. So one of the ones is way back when, anybody here do D&D or board game, you know, like role-playing games, not computer, but, right? 
So I was a consultant for Steve Jackson Games, and we were doing one. He had heard about some of us through the bulletin board service, which is an old version of internet. And um, he said, I've got this one going. And we went, okay, cool, and my name's the one way down in the corner there. <laughs> and we're three quarters of the way through testing what they had put together and everything, and the FBI walked in and seized it all, because they thought it was, this was back in the day of Kevin Mitnick, right? So they'd walk in and seize everything, take everything, walk away. And remember how I mentioned about Forrest Gump? Yeah. So this is the case that built the Electronic Frontier Foundation, how to protect your privacy on the internet. This is how far back we've been concerned about it. This was at the time when we could have done something about it. Now I'm gonna teach you on how to minimize the impact of privacy invasion on, as you're using the internet. But at this point, it's near impossible to protect yourself completely, and I'll show why in a little bit. The next kind of epoch of things that I did were, at that point in time, the only real people who were paying for this work were government or military. So there was a whole bunch of things called risk assessment, and I understand there's some uh, business risk managers that were also coming to the course. So a lot of this is going into an organization and reading their material, looking at their architecture, and going, huh, I think this one could cause a problem, I think this one could cause a problem, I think this one could cause a problem. And you'd base it on doing standards analysis. So you go on the checklist and go, okay, this standard says this, this standard said that. At that point in time, this has been superseded by a whole bunch of ones at NIST. But you basically go through all the different guidelines and go, okay, do, are they compliant? Did they follow best practices? And again, in the infancy of this profession being around, and you'd have to do like these little assessments, likelihood versus consequence, and go, okay, the system is gonna, isn't going to introduce too much or not. I've written more reports than any person on the planet should ever be subjected to have to do. Um, in terms of the next epoch, after that, and writing and writing and writing about the theory of incidents, it got a little boring, and I thought, you know what? I want to actually see how these incidents are happening. So I kind of refocused, and I started doing, running a practice that did security testing and um, incident management. So we'd have a customer that call us up and go, hi, we're in a hospital, we have a situation where the heart monitors are not functioning properly. Could you please come and take a look at them? Okay. You come and take a look at them. They're an unmanaged network. Um, they really don't know what they're doing inside. And you start to realize that because they're using very old technology that's unpatched, embedded into those heart monitors, there was a computer virus that had flooded through the whole hospital and patients who were connected to those heart monitors were affected. So now try planning how do you do antivirus on a heart monitor that's helping do life-sustaining equipment. Does that sound like a technical problem or does that sound like a logistics problem? Think about that. So after doing a whole bunch of those, I, I had the career highlight. Um, Somebody had come up to me and said, do you think you could test everything of the OSI stack from level two to level seven simultaneously in five days? And I went, pardon? We got lucky enough to have the Olympic Games come in and say, in Canada, and they had said, can you create a test for this? Go away, come back in a week, let me figure this out. And you had to sit there and go, okay, if I do L2, which is, you know, packet, exchange, all the way up to my application, how do those bleed into one another? And can I test this one from this time to this time, and this time to this time, and this time to this time? Yes, I figured out a plan. No, I did not, because it turns out that we missed something, and uh, the VoIP kind of bounced out of the test environment. The, some of the testing that we did bounced out of the environment we were doing and then affected the company that was running the stuff and then went straight into the IOC. And by the way, the three o'clock in the morning, getting a phone call from the IOC going, why don't our telephones work? Not the thing you want to do in your career, okay? It's, uh, but it was, it was an amazing experience. But again, I had really good people who were doing the testing for me. My job was to figure out how do I put all of that together? After doing that, it was really fun that I went, 
you know what, I'm really tired of dealing with these bad guys doing something about it. I kind of want to do something about it. I want to stop the bad guys. You'll learn why that was a fallacy in a second. I want to stop them. So I started doing some work trying to see if I could find the bad guys, because I was getting really tired of trying to clean up after them each time. So I got really lucky, and then I got to work first with the FBI and then with my local national police and the British police to start saying, hi, I'm seeing these attacks. Here's some attack information. Can you go ahead and do it? And so I got to do things like work on the DNS changer working group with them. I got to work on some Citadel analysis. I got to do Game Over Zoos. And then my company that I was working for got smacked by no crew. So I got to have my own fully self-sustained case where I had to harvest everything and then get various law enforcement agencies to help us go after them. And we did actually manage to get them arrested. So why did I tell you all of that? Because over the course of four decades, I've realized at times I made errors. I thought, oh, I really have to be super technical. I thought that I have to um, focus on the bad guys, that I'm never going to solve that. So I want you to learn from what I figured out. The number one thing that I found out, remember how I said, what was the very first thing I'd done? I wanted to get the bad guys and make them stop. Can you stop crime? You can't. You can manage it. You can protect yourself. Can you stop somebody who wants to break into your room on campus? If they are de desperate to break into your room, they're going to find a way. But you can do a whole bunch of really great things, including keeping an eye out for one another to prevent that from happening. And it's not much different on the internet. These days, we talk about a whole bunch of different cyber crimes that are happening. Everything from um, phishing emails, spam. We see Trojan and malware being dropped. We see bad guys doing exploiting data, fraud, extortion, theft of property, intellectual property theft. We have physical words for those kinds of crimes. The only difference is, if I had been smart four decades ago, it would have been, wait a second, this is just bad guys using technology to do a new version of crime. So don't think when you're doing this, I'm going to go into it, I'm going to become a security architect, and I'm going to stop the bad guy. Think bigger. Remember that you're dealing with crime. You're dealing with people who are trying to do a bad thing, or more importantly, a lot of the time you're going to deal with insiders, which are poor colleagues have to deal with. Um, where people do stuff because they don't realize what they're doing. I would say in the course of my career, 70% of the incidents that I've had to deal with are people being dumb. Okay? The first time I had to deal with a major fish outbreak, anyone want to hazard a guess what the click-through rate was? How high? Okay, well, I'm not as bad as that, but it was, it, it was 41%. 41% of the staff went, oh, this looks legitimate, and clicked on it. Oh, in my world, there was 100,000 endpoints. That was a lot of machines that we had to outsource to clean up, because at that point, I wasn't going to do it. And after we had put in all the mitigations and blocks and everything, again, I'm coordinating, coordinating technical teams. I walked into the head of IT and went, oh my god, we have the stupidest users on the planet. The one thing you should probably check before you do that is if they're on the speakerphone with the director of HR. Like you just, <laughs> not the thing you want to walk in and, and Scott's like, stop, stop. And of course the director is killing himself laughing at that and I'm just like, can we use you in our security awareness campaign? Sure. <laughs> you know? The other thing I want to talk about is that the one thing I have learned is that their motivations have pretty much stayed the same. We keep talking about new attacks, new things that are happening, but frankly, they're not new. They're just not. The motivations for these guys are usually pretty predictable. They're going for money or for fraud or for power, or they're going for some ideological reason. I have never seen a third option. It's usually one of those two things. And in every single case, I've also seen it's either an individual or a collection of individuals, 
or it's somebody that's trying to do it. I don't want to say it's a nation state, but sometimes they're doing it on behalf because they, they're very nationalistic, right? So it might not be the state itself, but they think, great Canada, Canada is going to rule the world. What's the little guy um, on South Park? You know, Canada rules, you know? We're going to take over, right? You know? But usually that's, you're going to have people falling in one of those quadrants. So you have the anonymouses of the world who are trying to do hacktivism to show that they are the, you know, the crusaders for privacy, they're crusaders for injustice, right? So that's when they're ideological, a group of individuals working together. You have guys like Limitless Logger, these guys are doing it purely for profit. They're going to come on your machine, they're going to drop stuff, they're going to keystroke logs so that you can get their, uh, they can get your banking information and then they sell your banking information. It's just that simple. There's a whole collection of them, you can go to the underground in a marketplace to buy your stuff. They're doing it purely for money. Individuals working as a collective, but still. Then you're going to have, that are doing it for the state. These are more like, um, this is the Mujahideen group that they do a lot of online hacktivism, DDoS, to pro promote an ideological, in this particular case, religious manifesto, that they push a lot of it. And then, for the nation states that are financial or power, you have groups like Pondstorm, who try and do things like affect elections. All right? Because they think their country is best. Again, it's not necessarily the nation, it's just people who love their country and trying to help it. The other thing that I have found that of the, person, of the portion that are true bad guys that are not insiders doing something stupid, of the, the ones that are left that are bad guys, more than half of them are real idiots. If I was gonna do a crime, I'm not gonna stand there and go, it was me, it was me, it was me, it was me. And yet in this day and age of publicity, it's fantastic, a lot of them will come up and say, Remember I said I did my own internal? They actually went on Twitter. You know that thing that logs your IP and all your stuff and went on Twitter and did a full admission of guilt for me. I was so happy. You know, we're gonna start it off. And of course, what did they not realize? Logging. This is why we love our security tools because when they do do stuff, we can turn around and they posted this site saying this was our chat. I went, oh, thank you. Thank you for including a timestamp. And I just went in the chat logs and went, there's your IP. Fantastic. You just made my job significantly easier. Right? And then he went out and said, hope the Mounties bring some syrup. So of course, what did I do is when the FBI arrested him, I shipped down some maple syrup and asked if they could deliver it when they got a guilty verdict. <laughs> Here you go, we want some Mounties. Here. Canadians can be vindictive. <laughs> the other thing that I thought was fantastic is one of my kids, wrote a, a paper on one of the underground guys called Lord Fenix. And then he was kind enough to retweet it. <laughs> you're like, dude, come on, we're writing, talking about all of your bad stuff and you retweet, look at what Trend Micro's writing about me. Like, oh my God, please. <sighs> you know, how to make life easy for us. Twitter, could you please go take this over to FBI and let them have some fun, you know? The other thing that I found that are distinct is when we're talking about computer viruses, there are four things about computer viruses that absolutely never change. They can talk about, oh, it's doing this, it's ransomware now, it's whatever. Always four same things. It how infects the machine, email, drop, watering hole, whatever. The payload and the capabilities, DDoS, keystroke logger, whatever. The CNC method, for a, my, a, a malware to work, it's got to call home. It might be low, slow, and sneaky. It might use shortwave uh, Bluetooth between machines, which is the latest technique that they figured out. But they always, at some point, have to coordinate to go home. They just do. So if you can figure that part out, then you've got a way of tracking it. And last but not least, the thing that drives my career nutty is the self-defense mechanisms. Does it prevent you from running in a sandbox? Does it delete itself and sit only in memory so you can only find it that way? Does it stay persistent because it's always in a registry key? But those four characteristics will always be the same. And a lot of the other attacks, same thing. 
once you start doing them enough times, you can see that they're always going to have this. So instead of making this all complicated, and it's like, oh, it's very hard, as long as you remember, bad guy's motivations and these, this will get you through 90% of any time you have to think about why are you protecting something. The other thing that I'd like you to think about is who here is in a software development, coding, engineering type program? Anybody? System development life cycle? They have a system development life cycle for the most part. It's why when you hear things like WannaCry had a callback. WannaCry had a callback because somebody stole code from something else and dumped it into WannaCry from years ago and it, they were just doing code reuse, and somebody missed when they were testing it not to let that function continue because the callback that they used was identical to a previous callback. So we were able to isolate very quickly to say, oh, that code was stolen from here, so these guys must be picking and choosing what they're putting into it. The life cycle always is that they design something, they do a prototype release that has no, doesn't do anything bad. They just want to see what software picks it up. They then redo with the code, system development, test, you know, test, redesign, re-engineer. They finally then re release it again without, when it does the bad thing, that's when it gets detected. So a lot of the times they're just going to send out an empty shell and go, we're going to send this out and get it distributed in a whole bunch of places and when it calls home, we'll give it its payload. Sneaky, because it's much harder to tell at that point that it's done something. It's only when they finally drop what the payload is, is when they call it a zero-day release. Almost every single time, malware will go through multiple iterations. They'll try it for a while and go, oh, yeah, we've exhausted that method. They'll do a, rec a code base, change their code base, do it a second time. And usually somewhere between the third and fifth time of doing these waves, they commercialize it. And either you can buy it on the underground, you can buy a do-it-yourself kit for it, this never changes. It's their business model. Doesn't matter what family you talk about, always the same way, at least in my experience. So in terms of longevity, that model that I just showed you, I wrote 15 years ago. And it hasn't changed. And it was applicable 15 years ago. Most of the other types of attacks have existed in some repeatable fashion that long as well. Has anybody heard of this current new big thing? New, <laughs> fake news, right? Oh, wow, scary. Which is basically a, a version of what they call information warfare and when information or information operations. It's how do you manipulate how people think? New technique, right? Nine, what was it? 1995. Cyber war is effectively, information warfare is effectively fake news. How do you get people, how do you post a bunch of things to make people think a certain way? Military's been using it for 50 years, right? So what we say is brand new, a lot of the time is just rebranding of something that's existed for a really long time. Understanding where things have come from actually make it way easier to address the attacks that are happening today. Understanding the, the fundamentals for this stuff. The other thing that became a real shock to me the first time I learned it was the underground is just another form of business. Anybody here use Amazon? Small, little, tiny purchasing platform. Would you believe a lot of the marketplaces look identical to Amazon? You just go on it and it's like, oh, what do I feel like buying today? Now this one has been taken down. But Silk Road, Alpha Bay, everything, they all looked exactly the same. It's like, I feel like buying a piece of malware. I feel like buying credit cards and they're dirt cheap, I should mention. You just go on it, it's like a little search browser once you've secured yourself, and you just go in and find out what you wanna buy. I haven't put the slide up here, but the thing that I find fantastic is their seller's ratings. <laughs> so you can actually see in some cases where the seller will go and then there'll be people that'll go, oh, this seller's Molly was fantastic. This seller turned around and gave 50% extra for me, so I totally recommend you buy from him. And I'm like roaring reading this stuff. But it's business, it's, it's no other business and it sounds like it's all scary and it's all fancy and really, it's a bunch of people trying to make money. They're just doing it in a different way, in a highly illegal way, but 
it's not as complicated as people tend to try and make it out to be. The other thing that I've found is there's some very, very basic hygiene things that can sustain you and protect you from most of your online experience. The first one is, if you get nothing else out of this talk, please stop clicking on things. Please, please, please. Take your mouse, hover it over it. On Apple, there's a way of looking at the code to see what that URL is as well. Until you know what it is, don't click it. I would say more than half of the, the stuff that I've had to clean up is because somebody went to a bad website, somebody clicked on an email, somebody went, ooh, look at this, they're giving me a refund, even via SMS. Don't download when it says, oh, I want to install. Don't until you know for sure. The case that I'm working on right now involves we used, we've convinced everybody, fake AV, like somebody's gonna come in and say they're gonna protect yourselves. They have created a version of Skype, malicious version of Skype. So it goes, there's an update for Skype, would you like to install it? How do you, how do you know? There's only one way you can do that, figure out where you're downloading it from and then figure if that's legitimate or not, right? And in this case, the Skype downloads it, it rewrites some of the security software that you have on your machine and then it turns around and does things like search for all the really inf interesting information on your machine and sends it out. Now, do you want to know what the growing area for targeted attacks are? Universities. Want to know why? Governments are really hard to figure out what um, to break into their systems. They know to protect themselves, but the university campuses are not. And a good chunk of the research and development done for governments or for high-end businesses are via grants at universities. Why would I possibly try and attack a corporate network if I know a student is working on a research project on the identical thing and I can get all of the raw intelligence from that for competitive intelligence purposes? Right? So, Number one growth area for targeted attacks, and I don't mean state-sponsored, I mean somebody trying to make money learning about the intellectual property that you students are generating is coming from campuses like this. I'm not saying you have these attacks here, but I'm saying I've had to deal with six different campuses in the last year up in Canada for these kinds of attacks. So, and the number one spam target, more than half of trends spam comes from the educational field. So something to really think about. The other thing that I'll get into a little more detail, please don't share your private information with somebody. I have, I'll talk about how I can harvest a whole bunch of information from you so I can sound really credible and then come back to you and go, oh, here, I'm from your TD bank and I am trying to help you because I need, I see there's a problem in the back end and I know that you just took a trip to blah, 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 because I could see it on your Facebook. Give me your account information so I can log in and fix it. I'll explain why, but please don't share have very strong passwords and privacy settings to help prevent the first one. And if something seems way too good to be true, it probably is. It took me a couple of decades to get my mother to realize that one. I'm sorry, I live on coffee, so you'll have to excuse me here for a moment. If I was gonna give you three hygiene rules, and I'm sure you all have heard this before, is to try and be safe Try and be kind and try and be smart. You are all technology aware. You have it much better than when I was starting off using technology. Don't do some of the practices that I said. Also remember that technology is a reflective technology. So when you are blasting at your boyfriend because how could he possibly not turn around and wish you luck, that's more your, this morning. Um, <laughs> That's more of your own projection on the technology. It doesn't show you what that emotion is from that other person. A lot of the time, we tend to be incredibly harsh online, and we're changing our entire society because we're not realizing what we're feeling from other people isn't actually from that other person. It's from ourselves, and then we get angry at them. Talk to some of your psych counterparts, and they'll tell you a little bit about this. And the other thing is really be smart about what you're doing, right? The reality of online is that it never goes away. 
and I trust me, I'll show you in a minute. It's never private. I love this one. Do you know how many people I've had to explain your data doesn't come from you and the, the carrier pigeons don't take your data and just drop it where you're going to go? It bounces all over different people. And at the very minimum, every administrator between where your data started and where your data ended, including the guys that are running the wiring, can look at that traffic. When I worked for a major telco, people go, oh, you can't see the traffic that's passing there. Oh, really? I use a network capture device, which I can do, put it as it crosses a router, right? Because it's transporting, say, from one company to another. And as a telco, I can see it going across my back end. I put in a thing, and I can get a full network capture. I can replay your Twitter. I can do whatever. So you're relying on the trustability of the ISPs. Now, keep in mind, most of the, the ISPs have lots of stringent rules to prevent people from doing that kind of thing. But the risk is still there. And you don't know if one of these guys don't get hijacked and reroute it to somewhere else. So really be careful about that. What you think is private really never is. Don't send anything you wouldn't want in full public view. I don't care if it's just on your small little phone. It is really easy for that either by somebody else or you know computer virus to get spread. I've had to deal with more kids going, well, I just snapped a little picture of this. I wanted to show my girlfriend my outfit and it going horribly, horribly awry. And like I said before, it's hard to tell who's watching because you don't have visibility into from where you're going to where your data is. And again, the reflective what I talked about, right? And this is the big one for me. True or false? Social media accounts are free. False? Social media, you are the information producer. You are not the customer. Keep that in mind. Facebook and is not as huge, and Google is not as huge in this city because they are free. They have to make their money somewhere, and they're not getting it from the users. So therefore, the users are not the customer. Please keep that in mind when thinking about when I said is your data and, and, and I literally am friends with the head of security for both of those companies. So I know they do their utmost best. I really do. I'm not knocking them. But please keep in mind, their business model is extremely successful, and they make money through their advertising. And the more detailed information you give them, the more valuable your, you become. Because they can get targeted ads. And the more the ad is targeted towards you, the higher the price of advertising they can get from it. So if you publish a billion things about yourself where I can turn around and say, based on the fact that you go surfing all the time and that you're in university and that I can see that you use a broken down car and everything, I'm going to target this very specific thing to you because I know you're likely to buy it because most people in your demographic will do that. Right? So like we just said, you in the, the user agreement, you sign off to giving that information. I'm using Instagram here as an example, but pretty much all of them say that. Even if you post a picture up there, they have the right to reuse that. It does not matter what the picture is of for whatever they deem to do so. You have given them an unlimited license to it. Are you okay with that? Really think about it. Now, my kid is the most technologically advanced kid you could possibly get. I let him have social media once he was old enough. I just want you to be smart about it. Really think about what you're doing. Think about your privacy settings, and you can still do it. I never would advocate not using it. Just be smart. So all of those choices, like I said, add up to a pretty decent profile. Right? Talks about you can figure out your friends, your likes, your shopping. I create that fantastic little demographic. This is another one that I'm working on right now. The bad guys have realized, by the way, this is my standard method is pen and paper. I'm old. Um, the bad guys have realized that every time they get on a click on an advertisement, they can make a whole bunch of money. 
So now they're dropping malware on your machine, not because they want to do something, but they want to use your machine for processing when you are not around. All they do is browse and click on stuff. You're back in class or whatever. Their, their malware, once it's dropped, that's the clicking on the back end, they're trying to get as many, or you're going to a web page, and it'll put a whole bunch of hidden clicks underneath so that their advertisements, it's like the old 1-900 the old one numbers where your phone would be forced to go connect and you'd pay five bucks or whatever. They're now adapting this to doing clicks on ad banners. Kind of interesting. And hard to track. So if I'm going to summarize that, I'm going to ask you to please be savvy about it. Use good habits when you're online. Practice good use. Don't post pictures of all your friends and protect yourself. So that's the end of my cyber hygiene. Please don't make my life more complicated, Nag, or your colleagues. I'm a mom. I'm allowed to throw in nags. The other thing I would suggest, you'd all think that my on, I protect myself perfectly. It would never happen to somebody like me, right? <laughs> so I suggest Google yourself once in a while. Remember how I showed you that GURPS thing? It's still on the internet. Do you think it makes my applications to a job that much better when somebody goes, oh, you're a gamer? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I hope that's not a problem. All my married information, my ex-husband's name, everything. It's not that I put it up there. By nature of using your phone, your, tel your for phone for browsing, your telephone number gets exposed. It then goes into other databases and so forth and so forth. Never look at people. You will scare yourself to death, right? Even something like one of my classmates in high school posted to one of those sites all my information. And I can't strip those down. I can call friends and family and go, can you, like, because obviously you work for 40, 30 years, four generations of different people doing this kind of work. You get to know a few people, so you can call on favors. But even I can't take everything off the internet, right? And then things like papers that I wrote eons ago still show up. Again, because the working group put it up there. The thing that I do for my kid is I have a Google alert. I know his handles and everything. I have a Google alert that pops up so that as soon as something of his inappropriate pops up, that I can try and take it down. If you try and address it quickly before it gets to some of the internet archiving, you can do a decent job of protecting your privacy. You can also really tell well when, say, Facebook or Google or Instagram have changed their privacy because all of a sudden your stuff becomes public. And so you can work, and then you can hop very quickly to lock it back down again. So to do this part quickly, I wanted to just tell you what does a job in cybersecurity entail, and I think you've probably got some idea of it at this point already. It covers a huge area. As I told you, the four epochs that I did are vastly different jobs, up to and including writing policy, right? And sometimes if you're really lucky, you get to have a job like hunter, kill a ninja pirate. I know William, he's an awesome guy, and I went, how did you get that title? It's like, I asked for it. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay. The other thing is, have you noticed a lot of the stuff that I've told you? There's some really phenomenally good technical folks out there. Let me go back to, I am a middle-aged soccer mom. I am a behavioral person. I, I took criminology in university. I didn't finish. I don't recommend it. It is a career limiting move, not when you first go into the market, but when you want to promote up past just doing an analyst, it becomes very difficult. Um, but you don't technically have to be technical. So if I go back to this list here, none of those jobs, even incident handler, are technical. You have to understand and be able to follow along somebody being highly technical, but you yourself do not. Most of my job has been logistics. Making sure this landed here at this time, and this one landed here at this time, and this landed here at this time, and if I turned around and put this A and B together, will that cause C or D to happen? A lot of my job is sitting there in my chair, staring at the roof, thinking things through. The other thing I want to point out is some of you heard me talking earlier about my child. My son has spent his life as a single mom following me around at some of these jobs and sitting on the couch watching. I had this wonderful experience one time that he was watching TV and I was sitting there looking at a new zero day for Redkit 
and he started snickering. And at this point, he really wasn't into computers too much. And I was trying to keep it away, silly me. And then I was told, let him be like his mom. And I go, what's up, babe? And he's like, good luck with that. I'm like, oh, great, precocious eight-year-old. Could you explain a little further? And he's like, yeah, have you checked your refer tag? OK, I go and look at it. I am looking at information on where the bad guy's CNC is, where their command structure is. The thing that tells me how the victim got there had my company's name listed in it, AKA my company was being used to infect all the victims. My eight-year-old had figured that out. And I'm like, what? And he goes, did you see the bite size? Look how big it is. I'm like, so it's not just redirecting it, it's actually serving the malware to them. Have you ever had to try and call a VP to go, hi, Darlene. You know that hosting provider that you do with thousands of enterprise customers? Yeah, we have a slight problem. Where did I figure this out? We're not gonna tell you that part just <laughs> quite yet. Let's just solve the problem and I'll let you know. Flash forward a few years, I get woken up at six o'clock in the morning. Mommy, 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 mommy. Yes? The government's being attacked. What? He had woken me up because he had figured out, successfully, that you could use various gaming servers. You could, you could use them to get root on those servers. And because a lot of governments or larger enterprises allow their staff to log into those servers during their lunch hour and break to, to play and, you know, mental, you could drop into the gaming server. And then when the company shelled into it, you could reverse tunnel into them and bypass all of their firewalls. And he wrote me this nice little diagram, and this was all theory. He had just been reading up on it and watching YouTube videos and went, look at this. If my now 13-year-old has been able to figure this out, do you really seriously think a 13-year-old is a genius, or do you think it's not as technical as you think it is? He's just grown up, and he knows how to think in that way. But it's not, I mean, I love him, and he scrapes code, and he tries to teach himself C and Ubuntu and stuff. But he's not phenomenal at it or anything. There's nobody in this room who couldn't be as good as him. And he can figure this stuff out. So if you're taking a program and you're a little bit, meh, I don't know if I can do it, I'm going to tell you something. The number one thing you need to know how to do in this career is learn. You have to be stubborn, because a lot of it is mind-numbingly boring. It took me three months one time to figure out it, how to ask a question and 10 seconds to find the answer I didn't really want to hear. You have to be willing to pick up documents and learn all the time. What you're going to learn, and you have to be an information junkie, by the way, too, because you will have books and books and books and books, and you'll be reading constantly. Because you have to keep it. It evolves so fast. The, there are fundamentals that are always there, but it changes. So if you love to learn, and this, by the way, is a great spot to, to pick up how to love to learn and how to learn efficiently, that is the number one skill that you need to know for this field. The other thing as a single mom that I love about this field is the internet's kind of everywhere. I work from 60 acres of nowhere. It sounds like I had to be you know, in the office all the time. I never go into the office. When I talked about DNS Changer, I wasn't going to fly to where they were having the op. That was my lab at home, sitting there going, and the guys are like, how are you doing? And I'm like, well, I have one to chat with you guys, and I have one that's the malware analysis, and I have one that's sitting there looking at my network logs so that you don't kill the internet when you do DNS Changer because it kind of killed everybody's DNS. And it was like, that was my lab. That's my bet. <sighs> the nice thing about it, especially for women, you have a family, and a lot of the time, it is really, really hard in other professions. You have to go nine to five. My son's never known a life of daycare. He's known a life of having to stay with people like his grandfather or my boyfriend or somebody when I'm on the road, never gone to daycare. It's a really nice perk that a lot of other professions don't have, which is why it blows my mind that not more, more women aren't getting into it. Pattern recognition and learning are something that women excel at. There's many studies that say that. It's the ideal profession. We don't have enough of us realizing that, yes, there are traditional issues, you know, getting into those fields. But frankly, at my age, we have two women that pretty much run Canada and kick everybody in their butt. And nobody turns around and goes, oh, you know, and guys, I'm sorry, but it, I just wanted to put in my little plug about, could some more women get in this profession, please? <laughs> you know? Especially when you have little kids, because I was a single mom from the time he was like six months old. 
and the, the fun part is sometimes your job actually does involve swords, you know? So like we were at a long story, but I, I couldn't resist showing the sword. Not mine, one of my colleagues. So what are my two biggest challenges in this? They're not technical at all. And it's not even the learning. It's the paperwork. It's lots and lots of paperwork. Whether you're doing an architecture, whether you're doing design, whether you're doing a report, whether you're trying to do a security awareness campaign, there's lots and lots of paperwork. And this, you can take it any way you want. One from a lot of the time I script myself macros or whatever, and I write it, and I hit my wall, and I do it again, and I do, do my, you know, try and do my code, try and do my firewall signature. Somebody else does some code, realize that, oh my goodness, a very basic fundamental part of the internet that's been around for 30 years has one bite off and it could take out the entire internet, yay. So those are my two biggest challenges in this thing. Now, I have approximately 10 minutes left. I can, depending on how many questions there are, take questions, or I could give you a little case example of one of the cases that I have. So I first wanted to ask if there were any questions. It usually happens when I say I'm going to do a case and I just managed to. So what would you give as the, you know, you talk about clean behavior. What would you say is, you know, just practical things to, how do you protect yourself? From no. more of a, you know, layman rather than from a... From a key? Yeah. Number one, don't click on things. Yeah. Don't share your information with people that you don't know. Don't click on things and think about what people are asking you. Don't be trusting. Mm -hmm. It's horrible to say it. I'm a very trusting person by nature and I want people to use stuff, but really think about it. If somebody calls you up and even if they have a whole bunch of your information and sound like they know what they're talking about, check it out. What does it cost you? 10 seconds. And you might not, it's heartbreaking doing a phone call with a grandmother who's lost everything and she can't, the bank's going to give it back, but in that three hours, she's panicked, right? Um, don't click too much on stuff. Um, you know, think about where you're going in sites. Just don't web browse and go click, 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 click. Those are really the biggest practical things I can say. If you get infected with a computer virus in the end, my suggestion is erase your computer and start again. They are so sophisticated at this point. Like, I'm coming from an antivirus company, so please take this with the full weight of me telling you. I personally think it's easier to just erase and start again, because don't forget, not only does your information get attacked in some of these viruses, but your computer will be used to attack others. How would you feel if you found out that your machine was the one that took that money from that grandmother? It'd suck, right? So in terms of the sophistication of attacks or I think in the last 15 years or so I have to fight less with making people understand online what they need to do. I fight less with knowing that the tools that are out there are good to try and protect themselves so it covers a good chunk of it. I find the bad guys are recognizing that and so they're trying to find new business models. So every time we put in things like we get a high level of firewall, we get good protections on the home, we get seniors and kids to understand what they're supposed to do, the bad guys find a new way to do it. Ransomware is a perfect case in point. Ransomware isn't ransomware, it's extortion. And it's a business model that's been untapped and therefore you know, they're going to keep trying to do more attacks in that area. There's nobody in it. These are business models, right? Anybody else? Uh, one piece of clickbait I thought about when you suggest Googling yourself, and that is the, you know, the, the site that says, you won't believe what this website tells you about yourself. What's that? I mean, I have not clicked on it. It depends on which site. There are some of them that are trolling you. They're, they're basically trying to harvest all your stuff. And yeah, the bad guys know to go and do it. There's some others, there's one, um, PIPL.com, that I tend to use a fair bit. It's a well-known site that's an aggregator. And their business model is actually, again, to aggregate that information and resell it to advertisers, but they do offer that public service. So not all of them are 
you know, good, like uh, in Canada, we have a whole bunch of these Canada 411 and look up this person and you go there and all they're trying to do is get that advertisement to you. So they're not really getting you that much, but people is a good one if you want to do it. Or even just reading the headlines on the Google page. So I'm just going to skip down here for a second. since we're into questions. Sorry, there was somebody. Yeah. So what, what are major threats security professionals and yourself face today? I would say the number one threat to most people are phishing attacks or social engineering attacks because most of the other attacks come from there. The bad guys used to do web pages and things along those lines, but they find more and more that just sending somebody an email, I can even send you just a blank email and all that's doing is telling me whether your account is active or not, which then gives me other leverage to do things like maybe I want to try and use your account, maybe I want to try and hack your attack account, but it saves me a bunch of time if I just send you a blank email and I don't get a email doesn't exist reply back, that's already half my battle, it's recon, right? So I find most of it is, and like I said, on the university campus, half of our spam samples are from various universities. Do you have any idea how many computers are mining bitcoins without their owner's knowledge? God, wouldn't I love to. Um, so the type of data we have at Trend don't allow me to do that. That would be more on the ISP level. You could see, because you can see how it's calling home. I can only see what's happening on the machine itself and not as easily to see it calling back. But trust me, I would, I would love to find that out myself when I saw that... Uh, one of the TV ones was accidentally dropping. I'm like, oh, that's such a cool business model. Like, so a co distributed computation actually would be what probably is another area, whether it's Bitcoin mining, um, whether it's trying to do click, it's the, the distributed method of doing this revenue generation. Way in the back. Have you ever had issues with proxy items? Any issues with proxy items? In the sense of trying to find person using a proxy? Yes. Yes. Um, when I talked about Nell Crew and I said they were kind enough to do the IP, it was a, it was a proxy, proxy machine. Um, that one that I talked about with Click, one of the distribution methods is a proxy bot. It makes it difficult, but not impossible to trace it because you just have to do multi-hop. So I trace to that IP and I know the timestamp in the window and then I go from that IP, I pivot and I try and find all the traffic to that IP and so forth. Once you've, you've traced that whole infrastructure, then you can hand it over to folks to turn around and say, okay, this machine was connected to from that machine. That machine I happen to see is infected with Zeus, whatever. Um, I see these other things connecting into that box. I don't know, every hop that you go back, your, your level of confidence in your analysis goes down, but sometimes you get lucky and you can kind of say, oh, I see this traffic and I know that kind of family of attack does the thing that I'm looking at, so you can kind of hypothesize about it. And that's when you turn it over to law enforcement and go, now you're gonna have to go and do some warrants and production orders and try and get the information from those machines or you get really lucky and you call the person up and say, hi, I'm really, really sorry to tell you this, but I think your machine is infected. Do you mind going to take a look and tell me what you see? That collaboration amongst folks to, to tackle the bad guys is incredibly important. Nobody can do this on their own. And it's specifically because of proxies. And I have a second question. So after, if you do like a re-imaging and a re uh, reboot and all that, and a new hard drive, you should be clean. If it was infected? Most of the time, but not all of the time. Sometimes it can be at kernel level and they've injected into the firmware. I've, I've only seen one or two very rare pieces of malware that do it, but it does happen. So Upside is I've only ever had to do it twice where I've seen that. But yeah, it, it, you can get to it. But by far and large, everything that we've seen, if you wipe it properly and you clean it properly and you have it isolated properly, if it reinfects again within a short period of time, it's more likely the peers around it and the connections, or maybe it has an open share or something along those lines. Or somebody's taken the same infected USB key and stuck it back in in order to re-image it. I've had that happen before where I had a tech turn around and go, it immediately got it and the bad guys must be right down into it. And I'm like, did you use the same key that, you know? And, sorry, I'm just gonna, oh. 
uh, this week I received an email from one of my colleagues on campus, and it said, uh, urgent, are you with your desk? Urgent, are you with And then I thought, I mean, you know, so I looked up at the address, and it was at uh, the name address was United View, but when I looked at the name, it was directed somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, so then I thought, this is really strange. And this is not from that person. So since I happen to, they really are a friend. I called them and said, "Did you send me a yeah. message?" And she goes, "No, I don't know what happened." <laughs> so, so then I just reported it as fishing. But I wondered if I had responded, all it needed, I guess, would try to verify whether I was a legitimate. No, it's, it's a social, yes they could, but it's social engineering attack. What they'll do is start a dialogue with you to try and convince you that your friend, that they're working on behalf of your friend. It's an entire class of attacks that stem from something called 416 scams, like the old dating scams. They'll try and date somebody online. Now they're saying, my, and I've had a couple of friends the same thing, where it's like, oh my goodness, I'm caught here and I have no money and this person is bouncing something for me. Can you please send them X number of dollars because I can't get out of the country and there's stuff going on and it's just, a, it's an online scam. So, and unfortunately, that was the end of my time. So I wanted to thank you all very, very much for having me today. I really appreciate it.